Mm. So, g'day everybody. It's uh, Ryan Alexander here from No Meat May. I'm here on the No Meat May couch um, and welcoming you all to this really um, exciting event, which we've got today, the lovely Emma from the Doctors for Nutrition. Uh, now, Emma's going to run through an uh, introduction to plant-based uh, nutrition for us, which is uh, highly valuable. So I think of all of our signups each year, uh, Emma, we, inter we, I guess, survey them to find out what the motivations are for people doing them. It may, and there's plenty of people who are concerned about the environment, they're concerned with, um, rightly so, around climate change and overfishing and uh, deforestation, all the issues we have there. Also concerned about the, the you know, massive uh, cruelty and violence to animals that we, um, that we sort of hide away. Um, and a whole lot of other issues that we, we decided, but number one reason is actually health. So the number one yeah. uh, reason people sign up is they want to improve their health. And we very much encourage people to go to the evidence-based information, to talk to practicing dietitians, uh, look at the research and not listen to all you know, the snake, snake oil salesmen out there who are to, you know, all the misinformation. So um, on that note, I'm going to hand over to Emma and I'll, I'll sit back in the wings, keep an eye on questions. So if you have questions, throw them in the comments. And we'll give those uh, questions to Emma. Otherwise, if we don't have time in the session, because there's a lot to go through, Emma will uh, endeavour to answer all those questions afterwards. So throw over to Emma. Absolutely. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen here. Just bear with me. Okay, can you see that okay? That looks great, yeah. All good. Brilliant. All right. Um, so hi, everyone. Huge hello. Massive thank you um, to all you amazing legends who've signed up for No Meat May. I think there's more than 65,000 of you this year. So that's just amazing. Um, before I dive into the talk, I just want to briefly acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land that I'm currently on. And I'm speaking to you from Yugambe country, which is a beautiful part of the world. Um, now, I know some of you will already be pros at living a plant-based lifestyle, but for others, this is a pretty big step outside the norm, and I'm sure that you'll have plenty of questions. So today, I'm hoping to show you that this way of eating can be healthy, it can be easy, it can be just really damn delicious. Um, but as with any diet, whether it be plant-based or not, there is a little bit of nutrition know-how that you need to know, and that can go a long way. So we want you to all be feeling fantastic this month and into the future if you continue on with eating this way. So I'm here to give you a brief overview of Plant-Based Nutrition 101. Okay, so quick intro to me for those of you who haven't seen me around the traps before. My name's Emma. I'm an accredited practicing dietitian and fellow of the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine. I serve as the lead Queensland dietitian for the health promotion charity Doctors for Nutrition. But probably the most um, interesting to everyone out of all of these doc points is the fact that I've been meat free for roughly 14 years. I've been completely plant based for over 12 and I'm still waiting for that protein deficiency to kick in. Uh -huh. So um, firstly, to put everyone's minds at ease, let's take a look at some good stats here to show you that this way of eating is not devoid of nutrition, but it can actually be really fantastic as far as health outcomes go. And I just want to note that these stats, um, they're not pulled from some small obscure study with hardly any participants, but this is taken from really large population-based studies that have thousands of individuals. So the results do hold a bit of weight here. I won't run through the lot, um, but these are figures comparing vegans and vegetarian diets to omnivorous diets. And as you can see, the plant-based eaters have a 32% reduced risk of heart disease when compared to meat eaters. Hypertension rates are slashed by 75%, a 62% lower risk of type 2 diabetes and 19% lower rate of developing any cancer compared to omnivores. And the 2019 Eat Lancet report even went as far as to estimate that 11 million premature adult deaths could be prevented each year if we made the switch to plant-based diets. So why does a plant-based diet help? Um, I won't run through all the technical stuff because it can get a bit dry, but basically by eating this way, you increase your intake of beneficial phytochemicals, of any oxidants, your vitamins, your minerals, your gut loving fiber. You're also very likely reducing your overall caloric density, which is great for long-term weight management. Meanwhile, you're reducing or eliminating compounds and foods that are detrimental to your health, including some that are actually known carcinogens. And it's really important to remember that we eat food, not individual nutrients. So food is very much a package deal. 
So yes, meat might come with protein and iron and zinc, but it also comes wrapped up with compounds that are detrimental to your health too. So things like saturated fats, trans fats, cholesterol, all of which have been linked to heart disease. We've got um, chemical contaminants like heavy metals and PCBs, not to mention the nitrosamines in certain meats that have been known to cause bowel cancer. So really important to ask yourself, do the benefits outweigh the risks? You can still get your iron, your zinc, your protein from plants, but now they'll come hand in hand with beneficial compounds that promote health. I love this slide, Emma. Sorry, just that, that last one. I love it, the, the, that concept of a package deal that you are, it's because a lot of people just think meat equals protein. Absolutely. And all the protein is, and that's the biggest question you get, I'm sure we get, um, where do I get my protein from? And that's really, that slide just breaks it down that you are not just getting your protein, you're getting all these other things with that. And, and actually, where does meat get its protein from? Plants. So, yep. Yeah, spot on, spot on. Go to the, go to the original source, cut out the middleman. Um, <laughs> So as it's no meat may, let's take a look at meat specifically now. Um, a few years ago, the International Agency for Research on Cancer completed a really thorough review of the literature on meat, processed meat and cancer risk. So the working group evaluated over 800 studies. So it was a really big undertaking. And after reviewing the literature, they ended up classifying red meat as a group 2A carcinogen, meaning that it probably causes cancer. But they went one step further with processed meat, classifying it as a group 1 carcinogen, meaning we know that this is carcinogenic to humans. So processed meat includes salami, bacon, ham, sausages, uh, anything that's been salted or fermented, um, smoked or processed to enhance the flavour or in increase the shelf life. So these are the types of meats consumed by some Australians every single day. And for every 50 gram portion of processed meat daily, there's an increased risk of colorectal cancer by about 18%. And to put that into perspective, that's less than one sausage worth. So processed meats fall into the same cancer category as asbestos, gamma radiation and smoking. Um, now, I'm not insinuating that the risk is the same. This rating system doesn't assess the level of risk. That's really important to get that message across, across. But it does take a look at the strength of evidence and they're in the same category. Um, so plant-based options really are a fantastic way to go. There is a caveat, though. So there's been a real boom in vegan and plant-based food over the last few years, which is fantastic from an ethical and environmental perspective. We now have so much choice that it's never been easier to transition to plant-based meats or meat-free diets. But as far as health outcomes go, I hate to say it, but many of these foods are just as bad as the animal-based products. So I'm now actually seeing vegans and vegetarians in my practice that have health issues I once only saw in meat eaters. Now, I'm not trying to be the food police here and I'm not saying that you can never eat these things, but let's just be a little bit realistic about food. Remember, food is a package deal. Um, and just because a food is labelled as vegan or plant-based or meat-free doesn't automatically mean that it's healthy. Um, and in Australia, and it's similar in other Western countries, our diets aren't fantastic to start with. So between 90 to 99% of us aren't eating enough veggies. That includes a lot of plant-based eaters out there. Nearly four in five adults don't eat enough fruit and between one third to 41% of our calories are actually coming from processed and junk foods. So that's pretty massive. Um, so those food examples on the previous slide, you know, if you're completely new to this way of eating and you want to have some fun this month and experiment with transitional foods, that's cool. Um, but just be realistic about it and acknowledge that they aren't nutritionally equal or as health promoting as your good old beans and your veggies. So when it comes to food, both the plant-based eaters and omnivores tuning in today should start asking two really simple questions. Number one, is it from a plant? And for this month, I'm hoping for most of you, that's going to be a big tick. Um, but number two, how processed is it? So not all processing is necessarily bad, but for the majority of the time, we want to be eating food as close to how nature intended it, basically. So now I'm going to run you through what I call my little plant-based high five. Um, obviously, this is generalised advice, but eating this way is going to help set you up to ensure that you're covering most of your nutrition requirements. But if you do have specific health concerns, please see a doctor or a dietitian. Your needs might be different. Okay, so what this includes is one serve of flax or chia, 
two or more serves of legumes or a soy product, three serves of fruit and bonus points for including some berries here, four or more serves of whole grains and at least five serves of veggies, making sure to include some leafy greens and some orange veg in that category. Um, and importantly, if you do intend on sticking to this meat-free dietary change um, long-term, or if you want to ditch most or all of your animal products completely, make sure to include a B12 supplement. So that supplement is non-negotiable for the strict plant-based eaters in the group. Low levels can actually cause anemia or even permanent nerve damage, so don't muck around with that. And then I love this slide. I love the simplicity. I know you've still got more to talk about, but... Um... What you're saying here is if, if you breaking it down into five core food groups, if you like, and if you, on, in general, um, male, female, different age groups, if you generally aim for this, you will get the protein, the calcium, the zinc, all, all of the key stuff that you need. Is that, that's, yes. that's a general message, yeah? Yeah, that's right. It kind of takes care of itself as long as you're getting a good variety from each of these core yep. food groups. Yeah. Um, so firstly, why chia or flax? Um, well, to explain this, I need to talk to you briefly about omega-3 fats. So apologies for the bit of science that's coming up. Um, so your omega-3 fatty acids are really important for maintaining eye and brain health. They're also involved in cell membrane structure. So there's a lot of different roles that it plays in the body. There are three types of omega-3s that we should be aware of. So there's ALA, EPA, and DHA. ALA is a shorter chain fatty acid. This is the type um, that we consume in plant foods. So your flax, your chia, your hemp, your walnuts, your leafy greens. Um, this is actually considered essential, meaning that we have to eat it. Our body can't make it. Um, but our bodies can actually convert ALA into EPA and DHA, those longer chain fatty acids. But the conversion rate varies a lot depending on your age, on your sex, other dietary factors as well. So for example, saturated fats and trans fats, the type of fats that's found in all that junk food, um, omega-6 fats as well, they're found in a lot of your seed oils and many of your nuts. They can actually reduce conversion rates of omega-3. Um, when it comes to omega-3 and omega-6s, the right balance is really important because they share similar conversion pathways in the body, as you can see on this technical looking slide here, um, because they draw on some of the same enzymes as well. We generally speaking have too many omega-6s in our diets and not enough omega-3s. So this can be a bit of a problem um, because some studies even suggest that omega-3 too much, uh, omega-6, sorry, can reduce omega-3 conversion by up to 40%. So you can see here that most of your oils, also some of your nuts and your seeds will have substantially higher amounts of omega-6 compared to your omega-3. So we just do need to pay a little bit of attention to this to make sure that we can convert our ALA into those longer chain omega-3s. Um, it sounds all very technical and difficult, but basically this boils down to limiting your total fat intake, avoiding your trans and your saturated fats, so your junk foods largely, um, being aware of your omega-6 sources, so making sure you're not having too much, and this is largely from processed foods a lot of your vegetable oils as well. And finally, just making sure to include some flax or chia or even hemp seeds each day because they are really potent sources of your ALA. So if you're ticking those boxes, you'll be doing pretty well. But there is a lot of nuance in this particular topic. There's a lot of shades of grey as well. So at some stages of life, it may be better to err on the side of caution and just consider a supplement in addition to your flax or chia. But for this month, not an issue, just make sure you're including those plant-based sources. Yep. So one tablespoon of flax or chia. Um, I, I mean, and look, if you miss one, like you just um, you, you have toast and you're in a hurry and you grab a coffee and you just miss your, your, your porridge or whatever, um, to the next day, like is it, or, or doesn't work like that? <laughs> well, I mean, your body doesn't reset every 24 hours and need everything yeah. again. So it's a continual kind of process. Um, and you are getting other omega-3s in other foods as well. So there's good amounts in your leafy greens. So it yep. depends on what else you're kind of eating in the day, but you don't definitely need to just double it the next day. Just kind of be aware that you need these things most days. And if you miss one day who are there, I, I don't yeah, right, right. Just build them into your regular routine. And, and the other thing just on here with the fatty acid, coconut oil, which is an interesting one I've had some chats with about, but because um, a lot of plant-based uh, creators are amazing food out there now, Like, but some of them are really heavy on the coconut um, 
coconut yogurt, coconut oil, coconut um, creams, etc. They they are a saturated fat, and they and you're saying basically they can toy with the way that you absorb, um, or they can create issues with the way you convert your omegas. So, um, yeah. so not there are there are sometimes food. Is that right? Is that the, yeah. the term? Yeah, 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 yeah cool. It. And you'll see there. So the omega threes are the ones in blue. There's absolutely no omega three in your coconut oil. So it's it's not a fantastic choice to be having. Um, so yeah, definitely a sometimes food. Yeah, cool. Okay, so next up, we're going to be having a look at legumes or your soy products. So unfortunately, legumes have had a bad rap in the last few years, thanks to books like The Plant Paradox. Um, but I'm wanting to shut that down right now and put your mind at ease. Legumes are extremely healthy. They're a very valuable um, part of the diet. They're an environmentally sustainable protein, so much less resource intensive than meat. They're low in calories, they're really high in fiber. They also include those wonderful prebiotic fibers. So they're fantastic for gut health. Um, and they're a really good source of protein, of iron and zinc. Um, and they're actually linked with longevity. So this study found that legumes were the most important dietary predictor of a long life. Um, and I can't talk about longevity without briefly mentioning the blue zones first. So blue zones, if you're not aware, refer to the five regions of the world where there are whole communities that are most likely to live to 100 and be really healthy into their old age. Um, so as you can see, five very different communities from various areas across the globe, but they do share some similarities. So all of them consume predominantly plant-based diets and all of them consume legumes as their main protein source every single day. So legumes are seen as the cornerstone of every longevity diet in the world. The proof is in the pudding here. Please don't be scared off by lectins. Um, these foods are incredibly healthy. So please try and include two or more serves per day. And just on that one too, Emma, one thing we're getting in the group, in the Facebook group, is people are jumping in here and they're having beans and legumes and they haven't, they're not used to having them. So they're, they're getting all this yeah. extra fiber. And as you say, um, I think, uh, you know, gas as well that comes with that. So what... What we sort of say is, you know, start small, build up. Um, but I, what would I say? I was, I was liking it too. Like it's like an end of lease clean. You know, your body is sort of getting a, um, a hit with all the cleaners coming in at once and it's kind of a, a bit of a hit to the system. But yeah. it's a general thing to start small, build up and, and your body will adapt. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you're really struggling with it, I would go more for the um, lower fermentable option. So your tofu um, and start small with your other kind of beans and start with the smaller ones as well. So they seem to be more easily digested. So start with, you know, something like red lentils as opposed to going straight to kidney beans. Cook them really well, make sure they're really soft um, and just gradually ease into that. Otherwise it'll be party time down in your gut. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. And so I'm going to interrupt one more time and I'll shut up, but just looking at the feed, there's lots of questions coming through, which is excellent. We're getting lots of engagement online, but um, what we'll do is um, let Emma continue with her, her slides. And if we don't get to the questions through the slides, we'll come back and answer your questions after the live. So, um, yeah, so keep asking your questions and we'll come back to you. Yep, brilliant. Um, okay, so next we've got three serves of fruit. So fruit is absolutely delicious. It's sweet, it's juicy, it's the ultimate fast food. It comes with its own wrapping. So it's a great on the go snack. Um, but there are two things I wanna address here because it seems more and more that people are shunning it. So number one, fruit will not make you fat. Studies consistently link fruit with a lower body weight. Um, fruit is a high water content option. It's got fiber, it's got antioxidants. So it's completely different to sitting down to say, a bowl of Fruit Loops or having a handful of lollies. Um, the other thing I wanted to cover is you do not have to avoid fruit if you are diabetic or concerned about developing diabetes. So this 2017 study tracked over half a million people for seven years. So it was a huge study. And it found that higher fresh fruit consumption was actually associated with lower risks of developing diabetes in the first place. But for those that already had it, there was a lower risk of death and development of major complications. So the take home message here is eat your fruit. It's fantastic for you. Okay, next up, we've got four or more serves of whole grains. So the message here is just to choose your carbs with care. So everything from jelly beans to kidney beans are considered carbohydrates. And while it's true that refined carbs aren't all that great and they have been associated with detrimental health outcomes, the exact opposite is true for whole grains. 
So when you refine a grain, you remove most of the fiber and the beneficial nutrients and all that you're typically left with is a quick digesting starch. Your whole grains though, completely different. They're full of B vitamins, vitamin E, your different minerals and phytonutrients. Um, and they've got a decent amount of fiber to slow that digestion down. So this study was a big systematic review published in 2016. And it found that whole grain consumption was actually associated with reduced risk of death, reduced cardiovascular disease, diabetes, total cancers, as well as respiratory issues. Um, so really important to include these in the diet and not to be scared of them because of the carbs. Um, whenever you can, though, try and go for intact grains, so things like brown rice or quinoa, buckwheat, frika, barley, that kind of thing. If you're going for a slightly more processed option, like your breads, your pastas, your crackers, um, just try to keep that carb to five fibre ratio um, five to one or less. So what I mean by that is for every five grams of carbohydrates, make sure there's at least one gram of fiber. So take your trusty calculator out when you're going supermarket to the supermarket. So pull up your phone and do some sums and check the labels and just see what the carb ratio is. So if the number is like six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 or bigger, maybe not the best choice. Maybe just um, go for something a bit more fiber dense. And with that, is that sort of just a, like at the supermarket, you've got this whole wall of breads, you know, and products to choose from and they're, all that every mix of that you know you can imagine um yeah you look at the label as you said the five to one is a good one but it's generally like go for the, the whole grains and the whole meals or combinations of those yeah so absolutely so have a look at the ingredients list if the first ingredient is just wheat flour that generally means that it's white flour so you want to be looking for wholemeal flour on the ingredients list yeah yeah um okay so lastly we're going to be having a look at veggies so veggies basically give you your best nutritional bang for your buck. Um, leafy greens and cruciferous veggies are especially great sources of iron, of calcium, of antioxidants. Um, they also come packed with compounds that are really great for cardiovascular health as well. Um, to really optimize our diets though, we wanna be thinking color and variety because um, that way we're gonna be maximizing our nutrient intake. So it's very cliche, but we really do wanna be eating a rainbow every day because the pigments that give food their beautiful bright colors also provide us with beneficial components as well. And the benefits are all slightly different depending on the color. So eat at least five serves of veggies and get a good mix of color into your plate. So putting this all into practice, um, it's, it's not that hard. A typical day would look maybe something like this. So brekkie, you could have a nice big bowl of oats with some flax and some belly, berries, a um, bit of fortified plant milk, a bit of cinnamon if you're feeling fancy. Morning tea, you could have a piece of fruit and a handful of nuts. Lunchtime, tofu and veggie stir fry with some brown rice, some quinoa or some noodles. Afternoon tea could be some veggie sticks and hummus or some crackers and hummus. And then for dinner, nice big roast potato with some lentil sauce and a side salad. And then if you're feeling peckish for dessert, um, you could try some banana or mango and ice cream. So that's just where you're blending up frozen fruit. Honestly, if, I, if you haven't tried it, try it. It's delicious. Um, but as you can see, it's all really easy stuff. They're really basic meals to make. It's not expensive. You don't need hard to find ingredients. Um, and eating this way, you're going to be hitting all of your nutrition requirements. All right, so that's my little plant-based high five. Now I'm gonna cover some really common questions that I get asked a lot. And the most common question, can you guess what it is? Um, it's where do we get our protein from? So <laughs> the shocking news here is that all plants have protein um, and they all contain all of the amino acids just in varying amounts. So even that apple that you had for morning tea, for example, will have some protein in it. So if we take a look at what protein actually is, that's an umbrella term for 20 common amino acids. Over half are considered non-essential, meaning the body can actually make them, um, but nine are considered essential, meaning we have to eat them. So there's two that are worth a very brief mention for plant-based eaters, and that's lysine and methionine. So for example, lysine is high in legumes, but not so high in grains, whereas methionine is the other way around. So what this means is that these limiting amino acids become a bit of a non-issue as long as a person is consuming adequate cal calories from a good variety of food. Um, so how much protein do we actually need? This, of course, will vary depending on your age, your sex, your activity level, uh, but it's honestly not as much as everyone tends to think. 
So the average female needs about 46 grams per day, whereas the average male needs a bit more, around 64 grams. But the good news is that most of us are well and truly eating this anyway. Um, so this study looked at data from the Adventist Health Research, a really large study again with thousands of participants. And they found that the median intake of protein on a vegan diet was 71 grams. So eat your grains, eat your legumes, your fruits, your veggies. Honestly, you, you're going to be fine. That's a great chart. So it's showing that it doesn't matter, generally, it doesn't matter what your diet is, most everyone's exceeding that amount of protein. We're all getting weight. Absolutely. You know, and, and the other one I heard, heard is that, you know, fibre is the, uh, the, I guess, the nutrient that we should be concerned about. More so that's it. Yeah. Absolutely. That should be the one we're concerned about because that's the one that most people are actually not consuming enough of. Yeah. So I've got a great question here um, from in the feed, which I, I'm going to interrupt because it's relevant to this slide, but it's something that I was concerned about when I started eating plant-based food as well. And the question is, does it matter how you combine foods in terms of proteins? Because I know that some, some plant-based foods have some of those essential amino acids and some have others. And there was a theory, I think, that was going around many years ago that you have to make sure you combine certain foods together, otherwise you weren't going to get the protein. Yeah, so that's a really great question. And once upon a time, we did think that you had to combine different proteins at the same meal. So having grains with beans. Um, we now know that our bodies have amino acid pools that we can draw on. Um, so as long as you're having a good spread of nutrients over the course of the day, you should be fine. So I wouldn't, you know, push the limits there and go uh, a week but like as long as you're having your variety of your whole grains your legumes your fruits your veggies over the course of the day that's fine it doesn't have to be at the same meal yeah right good habit to get into though if, if you can um okay so protein what about if i'm an athlete um well if you're going to the gym a few times a week or if you're playing soccer on the weekends for example hate to break it to you you might consider yourself an athlete but you don't actually need to change all that much for the serious athlete though, I will just run through a few quick things. So obviously it needs um, to vary depending on your sport and the frequency of your training. Um, and your needs could range anywhere from 0 0.8 grams per kilogram right up to two grams per kilogram for some individuals. Um, most people won't need anywhere near that two grams per kilogram though. But it's important to mention that if you're exercising more, you're gonna be hungrier therefore you're going to be eating more food um, so you'll likely be covering these additional needs by default just by eating more calories um, optimal timing of protein remains a little bit unclear in the literature so some organizations still argue that it's optimal to have some protein within 30 minutes of exercise for you know optimal muscle protein synthesis but it appears that as as long as you're having your next meal within about two hours of your exercise that should be sufficient so what's probably the most important thing to focus on if you're an athlete is consuming protein evenly across the day. So don't fall into the trap of having, you know, a low protein brekkie, a low protein lunch, and then trying to dump all of your protein into your dinner meal, because that's not an efficient way of doing things. And that's probably the, the most common pitfall that people kind of uh, fall into when, when it's to do with protein. And is it fair to say too, I mean, like with, again, as you say, you get it throughout the day, but um, uh, some people sort of think, you know, just take the meat out and just eat, eat the veggies or eat what's left. But you do need to think about what you're replacing that meat with. If, if, you, if you're like, when you're doing no meat, may not, not overthink it, but are you getting some protein in with tofu or tempeh or legumes or beans or what? Yeah, to, to sort of, because you get, you feel more full, but you're also um, getting your nutrition. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good point. So you shouldn't just be taking the meat off the place and not repla replacing it with anything. Yeah. Um, so making sure that you're including those, not just for protein, but, you know, your legumes are great sources of iron and zinc as well. So, yeah, it's, it's a good habit to get into. Um, and just really quickly, I can't move on from the protein issue without addressing soy. So this is a much maligned food group and people seem to fear it a lot. <laughs> so I just want to quickly unpack some myths that refuse to go away in this space. Um, so firstly, you've probably heard that soy increases your risk of breast cancer. This is just not true. So this is not what the science shows. Higher soy consumption has actually been associated with a 30% um, reduced risk of developing breast cancer in the first place. And then for those who have already had breast cancer, soy intake has been associated with reduced recurrence and improved survival. 
Um, and it's thought to be especially helpful in the younger years where breast tissue is actually developing. So great food to include for children and teens. Um, Soy has also been linked with reduced risk of prostate cancer as well, so good for men. Um, on that topic, I'm sure you've all heard that soy has feminizing effects for men. Um, so it is true that soy does have phytoestrogens, which are plant estrogens, um, but it's been well studied. And those isoflavins, so those uh, phytoestrogens, they have no impact on circulating estrogen levels on sperm or semen parameters in males. Um, full disclosure, there have been two case studies in the literature where there have been negative effects. So two individuals out of how many hundreds of thousands of people that have been studied. Um, but can I just make it clear that these two men were consuming huge amounts of soy products. So one man who developed gynecomastia, he was actually drinking almost three litres of soy milk per day, which is far more than anyone would ever recommend because everyone's going to be recommending that you have a good variety of food. Um, dairy and meat products, however, they contain real estrogen. So this would be much more concerning to me if you were an individual that was predisposed to developing that kind of condition. Um, two out of the five blue zones consume between one to three serves of soy per day. So in moderate logical amounts, this is a very health promoting food. Okay, so moving on, next few questions I commonly get asked are around micronutrients. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna run through all of the micronutrients on the graph, but you can grab this infographic off my Instagram if you want to refer to it or download it off the Lentil Intervention website if you want to keep it on hand for the month. Um, the first one that I want to look at is iron. So the type of iron in plant foods is called non-heme iron and it's not as readily absorbed as the iron that's found in animal products. That's called heme iron. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because the iron in animal products has actually been linked to a number of poor health outcomes. But there are a few things to consider when it comes to plant-based iron. So depending on age and sex, the recommendations in Australia for adults are between eight to 18 milligrams of iron per day. It's been suggested that maybe a little bit more is required for plant-based people because of that absorption difference. Um, but I think it's also really important to mention that those who eat well-planned plant-based diets are at no greater risk of iron deficiency anemia than omnivores are. Um, so when you're thinking iron, I want you to think beans, greens, whole grains, your nuts and your seeds, but also be mindful that there are foods that can either enhance absorption or hinder absorption. So absorption enhancers include your vitamin C rich foods. So things like citrus, strawberry, kiwi fruit, broccoli, red capsicum, um, vitamin C can actually increase absorption so much that it basically removes that difference between heme and non-heme absorption. So that's a really important thing to be adding in. Other absorption enhancers include beta carotene rich foods. So things like carrots and sweet potato and fruits from your allium family as well. So garlic, onion, leek, that kind of thing. Um, factors that inhibit absorption include phytates, so phytic acid is found in a lot of plant foods, particularly your grains and your legumes, but they reduce when you cook or soak them. And I don't know anyone that walks around that's eating raw rice or chickpeas, so it becomes a bit of a non-issue. Um, the tannins and polyphenols in tea and coffee can greatly reduce absorption, though, up to about 70% in some cases. So move your tea and coffee away from your meals. That's a really important thing to do. And calcium can also reduce absorption as well. So if your levels are already marginal, um, I wouldn't be chugging back, you know, a whole heap of fortified plant milk or taking a calcium supplement at your meal times. Yeah. Um, you, haven't, you haven't got on to, um, the calcium's coming up. I was going to ask about if you have uh, your, your plant-based milk, this is calcium fortified and you have it with coffee, but that's coming up. Yeah. Yes, it's coming up. <laughs> Um, so just quickly before I move from iron, I think the most important thing to get into, into the habit of doing is pairing your iron-rich foods with vitamin C-rich foods. Um, and you'll notice that a lot of traditional recipes from various cultures actually already do this. Um, so putting some tomato in your dal, put some capsicum in your tofu curry, um, fruit on your breakfast cereal, squeeze some lemon or lime on your mixed beans or your salads. Establishing these habits now will set you up really nicely long term. Okay, so next up is calcium. So the Australian recommendations for adults are between 1,000 to 1,300 milligrams, depending on sex and age. 
Whether we actually need this much is still a little bit debatable. So for example, in the UK, the recommendations are only 700 milligrams, but regardless, we can achieve these numbers with just a little bit of planning. So quickly though, the main thing that people seem to be concerned about when it comes to calcium is strong, healthy bones. Um, but calcium is only one piece of the bone health puzzle. So vitamin D, vitamin K, um, a lot of your other micronutrients actually, as well as physical activity and plant-based proteins can all help maintain a healthy skeleton. Whereas too much caffeine, um, alcohol and salt can be detrimental. So when it comes to bone health, it's not just about calcium, uh, but nevertheless, we definitely do need it. So good sources of calcium include your low oxalate leafy greens, uh, legumes, calcium set tofu, your fortified plant milks, certain nuts and seeds like chia seeds, sesame seeds, almonds, um, but absorption really matters here as well. So for example, spinach is actually loaded with calcium, but because of the oxalates in spinach, we only absorb about 5% of it. Whereas your lower oxalate leafy greens, like your Asian greens, your broccoli, your kale, um, they have calcium that's even more absorbable than dairy milk. Um, I, don't, I don't want people to get too caught up in this and obsess over avoiding oxalates. But again, this should just kind of reinforce that a good variety of food in your diet is important. So don't just have one type of leafy green. Don't just have one type of legume. Don't just have one whole grain, like mix it up. Yeah, because your spinach and your beets, your great uh, Swiss chard, I mean, they're full of iron, yeah? So yeah, so exactly. If you have them in your, with some vitamin C in a green smoothie or whatever, or just fry them up, you're going to get all your iron but then you, you, you might not get so much calcium from them, but yeah, you vary, vary it up. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so the last one I wanted to cover is iodine. So this is a micronutrient that often gets overlooked and it really shouldn't. Um, mild, uh, mild deficiency in Australia has actually re-emerged in both omnivores and plant-based eaters. So iodine is really important for proper thyroid function and it's extremely important to be aware of if you're a woman of reproductive age. So in Australia, the levels of iodine in soil aren't that great. So typically speaking, the levels in fresh produce aren't fantastic either. Uh, we now have mandatory fortification of commercial non-organic breads. You can also get iodized salt if you choose to use salt. Um, and seaweeds will also contain some iodine as well. I would be a little bit careful with the seaweeds though. So some types can actually have way too much, which is quite damaging for your health. And a few are actually quite frequently contaminated with heavy metals. So for example, I would never recommend having tzatziki um, because it's quite commonly contaminated with large amounts of arsenic. So go for things more like your nori sheets. Um, if you consume bread, if you use iodized salt or if you're having seaweed regularly, you, you're likely gonna be okay here, but I'm not against the use of supplements if necessary, especially for women wanting to conceive. Um, so take home message here is just be a little bit careful about this one, whether you're a meat eater or plant-based. So regardless of diet, just keep iodine in mind. Um, and a quick note, a lot of those fancy pink salts, a lot of the sea salts, for example, they actually contain next to no iodine. So if you are using salt, just check, make sure it's an iodized one. And rolled oats is on there. That's rolled oats is an interesting one because I, I think a lot of people think of I don't know, they think that there's no gluten, I don't think, in rolled oats either. But people think there's, there's a, a gluten-like compound in oats. So some celiacs still yeah. will um, not be able to tolerate oats. Uh, it's yeah. called avenine. It's very similar to gluten, um, but it's often cross-contaminated um, with wheat. So you just need to be a little bit careful with that. Unless, unless, unless you have celiac disease, um, the rolled oats are... Oh, yeah. I mean, they're a nutrition powerhouse, hey? Like you probably, yeah, I mean, fantastic. Our, when we put together our meal plans, it's like you try, we try and make them exciting, but but a good bowl of porridge every morning uh, with tahini or, or and your nuts and seeds, et cetera, the nutrition you get out of that is um, like you go yep. through so many boxes, yeah? Absolutely fantastic. I I get a bit sad if I can't have my porridge in the morning. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, if you don't have celiac disease, you definitely do not need to be avoiding gluten containing grains. Um, oats are fantastic. So if you can eat them, please do include them. Um, okay, so I hope it's now pretty obvious that plant-based or meat-free diets can actually be fantastic as far as health outcomes go. Um, and there's just those few little nutrition tips and tricks to be aware of. But something I'm also very passionate about is that plant-based diets are not only good for human health, they are fantastic for planetary health as well. 
So climate change is the most important issue that we face as a society. It will affect every single one of us. Um, so, you know, climate, the climate emergency is a public health issue. And I say this quite regularly, but there's no such thing as a healthy human on a planet that is dying or dead. And we are at the pointy end of things here. So what we do in the next four to 10 years could impact the planet for the next few thousand years and beyond. And what we eat matters a lot in this space. So our food systems have caused 70% of biodiversity loss on land, 80% of global deforestation, and it contributes 25% of our greenhouse gas emissions. So shifting away from beef and dairy would reduce our diet related emissions by up to 70% and it would free up a hell of a lot of land for rewilding, which is going to be essential moving forward as we try to address this climate emergency. So really important for the planet. Okay, so to wrap things up, a few quick considerations moving forward. Number one, don't stop learning. So take a look through all of the brilliant No Meat May resources learn more about nutrition, learn more about diet and climate, get to know the basics. It's, it's really lucky that we are in a time where there's a wealth of free resources and information available to us. So read some books, check out some websites, uh, listen to some podcasts. So quick plug for the lentil intervention there. Um, but there's a lot of cool stuff to learn about plant-based nutrition and lifestyles. This was only a very brief kind of snippet introduction to things. Number two, learn to read labels. So it's important not only for avoiding animal products, if you're wanting to go completely plant-based, but also knowing what we're putting in our body, what we're fueling ourselves with, that's really important. Um, find your community. So this way of eating isn't the norm yet. I'm hoping that will change soon. So finding like-minded people is going to help lift you up, help you stick to those habits. It's just going to bring, bring you a bit of joy in your life on that social connection. So get involved in the Facebook group. Um, when you're eating out, don't be scared to inquire. So best tip here is to look at the menu ahead of time. But if you haven't had a chance and if there's nothing on the menu that you think will be suitable, ask your waiter, ask the chef. You'd be surprised what amazing dishes they can actually create. And I mean, be, be polite about it. But the more people that actually ask for a plant-based option, the more the owners are going to take note and think, hey, this is actually something that would be beneficial for me to put on the menu. And that's going to help catalyze that change. Um, simple tip here is don't shop when you're hungry. So if you're struggling with your meat cravings this month, they are absolutely going to be amplified if you're at the supermarket or a food hall when you're starving. Um, and lastly, be adventurous with new flavours and cuisines. So this shouldn't be a month of deprivation. It should be one of eating in abundance, experimenting with new dishes and fresh and beautiful foods. Have some fun with it. It definitely shouldn't feel like a chore. Okay, so just to close out, I'd like to say a really big thank you for tuning in. Um, if you want more info on that plant-based high five I ran through, I've got that as a free resource you can download on my website at Green Stuff Nutrition. Um, a couple of other free uh, resources on there that you can access if you want as well. But also just a quick little plug for the lentil intervention. So this is something I co-founded with uh, Ben Eidelberg from New Zealand. We've got a whole bunch of resources on our website We've also got a podcast as well, and we focus on plant-based nutrition, on movement and environmental issues. So please do check that out if you're interested. Um, but last but not least, I'm here representing Doctors for Nutrition today. Um, this is a fantastic health promotion charity. We've got the goal of revolutionising human health through a shift to plant-based diets, and we want to bring food back to the healthcare system so remember when I said don't stop learning, I'd encourage you all to check out the website because we've got some fantastic resources available for download. Um, we've got some for individuals as well as clinician toolkits. And we've also recently launched a new recipe collection and meal plan. So if you're looking for some delicious food ideas, please be sure to check us out. So doctorsfornutrition.org. Um, but just to close out, from the bottom of my, my heart, I want to thank you so much for taking part in No Meat May. You're doing fantastic things. You're choosing wisely. You're choosing to take meat off your plate this month. And that choice, it really does matter. So not just for yourself and for your personal health, but for every single living being on this planet, you're also contributing to a more fair and just food system. So just thank you for being a bunch of legends. Really appreciate it. Mm. Um, thank you so much, Emma. I was going to, um, uh, so you're giving No Meat May a plug there, and I was going to say give the Doctors for Nutrition a great plug too because we've just connected recently 
and like new best friends over there with uh, with yourself and Alicia and the whole team. Um, Adrian's been awesome as well in getting the message around men's health out there. So I reiterate that to go to the um, uh, the doctor's nutrition website and look at those recipes. We sent them out in our email, a link to the new recipe uh, catalog, but they are, they're f it's fantastic food in there, all nutritionally balanced, really exciting recipes. So definitely encourage you to go and have a look in there. Um, there are a heap of questions that have come through in, this, in, in the live stream. So um, have you got a couple of minutes now, Emma, just to throw a couple to you, might save. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. And if we don't have time, I'm happy to answer them offline. Well. Back to them. Yeah. yeah, one that's come up, just uh, nutritional yeast is a product that is in a lot of um, cooking, particularly uh, plant-based cooking and, and vegan cooking. Um, and it's B12 fortified. Now yep. there's different theories out there, but um, is, if, you just, if you're having nutritional yeast or noosh every day, um, Will you get enough B12 or do you need still you have to supplement with a sublingual spray, et cetera? Um, I would always recommend to err on the side of caution and just take the supplement. If you're wanting to rely on fortified foods, I wouldn't just rely on one um, because you don't know how shelf stable it is. You don't know how long it's been sitting on the shelf and how like degraded that B12 is. So if you are really wanting to avoid the supplement for whatever reason, um, don't just have nutritional yeast, also include something else that's fortified in there as well. So two to three different fortified foods just to kind of cover your bases. But the safest way is just to take a supplement. It's water soluble. It's, it's not going to hurt you. Um, it's very cheap as well. So, yeah. Yep. Excellent. Um, and then, um, and I guess, again, I've been the general gist of this presentation, which is excellent. If you're doing no meat made for a month, you're going to, you know, don't, don't freak out. Yep. Don't get OCD about it because you're going to, you know, you're not going to get nutrient deficiencies in a month. This is sort of just really good to set the foundations for. Um, and, you know, what's great about Nomi May is 90% of people report that they actually do eliminate or reduce meat ongoing. So this is about yeah. getting the foundations right early on, day five of Nomi May, get it right, and then take that through um, the rest of the year into um, into futures. But a couple of questions we do get up ar around is intolerance to some legumes. Now, I've heard this through friends and also coming through the feed here as well. Um, People say they, they might get reactions or um, allergies or skin reactions. And we spoke before about, you know, you can get a little bit of uh, extra activity happening because you're getting all this fibre in your food. But, but are there some people that just can't handle legumes? Is that, is that true? Or It will depend on your baseline gut health, I think. So gut health is quite a complex topic and it is highly individual. So if you have these kinds of issues with certain foods, I would recommend going to see an accredited practising dietitian so they can review your whole dietary history. Um, and make kind of personalised suggestions for you. But as far as legumes go, most people can tolerate them pretty well. It's just about easing into it. So if you are coming from a diet that's pretty rubbish and your gut health is just trashed and you go from having no legumes at all to trying to have a cup a day, you're going to struggle with that. Um, so my top tips would be just to start off really small. So even as small as a tablespoon to begin with, and just slowly increase from there. Start with the smaller legumes. So as I said, like the lentils rather than the big, bigger beans, make sure they're cooked really, really well. So they want to be as soft so you can just like squish them on the top of your mouth with your tongue, really, really soft to reduce um, the amount of lectins that are in them. Um, and some people with IBS might need to have a look at the FODMAP content of certain foods as well. And just be a little bit mindful of that. But yeah, if you've got issues with it that are stopping you from eating a well-balanced kind of meal plan, I definitely recommend going to see a dietitian. Yep. Yep. Excellent. Um, and uh, legumes, you know, you, you, you talk about, you know, soaking, et cetera. I'm, 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 I'm so into the cans. I just grab a can off the shelf and because yeah. um, they're, they're already cooked. Um, they've been soaked. You don't have to soak them, et cetera. But at that point, if you, if you just eat a chickpeas out of a can, um, uh, you, you're better off still to cook them um, to get some of those lectins out and or, no, I wouldn't be too concerned if it's coming out of a can. The main thing that I would recommend with a can is to put them in a strainer first and rinse them really well underneath water. You'll see what I mean when you look at it. Rinse until the bubbles go away. Um, and that way you're getting rid of a lot of those FODMAPs, which are water soluble. So just rinse them really well. Um, the ones in the can, the main concern that I would actually have is the salt content. So try and get a salt reduced option or salt free. Excellent. Yep. Good stuff. Um, now again, there's some specific health questions that are coming through. So we'd always say go and talk to, yep. I mean, you can, you can connect up with Emma actually, Emma does consults online. Um, so you can connect up with Emma directly and do a consult, which if, if you have a specific con concerns, but someone's mentioned here hypothyroid, which I think is Hashimoto's, I think a similar thing, but 
if you have um, have to avoid soy for protein for particular health reasons, what are good alternatives to protein sources? Now you went through that in your slide, I guess, but it's um probably you know nuts and seeds and um, yeah. So I mean, there is protein in everything, and there are people out there that don't consume any legumes and they still get adequate protein. That makes it a little bit harder. You've got to plan a bit more there, um, but there's definitely ways of getting enough protein if you do have to avoid the soy products and with um, hypothyroidism. So with thyroid issues. A lot of time you'll also be told to avoid um, goiter, goitrogen, so um, things like cruciferous vegetables, etc. That's only an issue if your iodine intake is, is not good. So usually you're actually fine to eat those kinds of foods, just making sure that you've got adequate iodine intake. Yep, excellent. Um, just a quick question on some pastas. You know, there's a lot of pastas out there now. It's great you're getting these high-protein pastas with chickpeas. Edamame is one that I love. Um, Someone's asked about, is it better to have spinach pasta? Now, I mean, how do they compare with, you know, like a whole grain pasta? And what, what sort of what should we be looking like? Is I was looking for, I guess, in terms of, you know, the good carbs, you know, as a regular. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm a big fan of like those pulse pastas. The legume pastas, I think, are fantastic. Um, but so are your whole grain pastas. So they're both really good options and they both kind of offer a slightly different nutrition. Um, you know, your whole grains will be fantastic for your B vitamins. Uh, I wouldn't really recommend buying into the gimmick of like the spinach infused pastas. I'd rather you just put some fresh spinach in your pasta sauce. I think that would be a little bit better. But yeah, good mix of pasta is fine. Protein, um, high protein pasta, like your legume based pastas are great, but so are your whole grain pastas. So include both of them. I think they're both really good options. Excellent. Excellent. Now, another one that's out there you hear about a lot is um, fasting, interval fasting, you know, like... Um... Don't, I don't eat before midday and I'll, then I'll just eat from midday through to all eight at night or whatever, then I'll go to sleep and then I'll give my system a rest for, you know, 16, eight hours a day or something. Well, what do you think about those concepts and or? Um... Yeah, I mean, if, if, if it works for you, that's cool. Keep doing it. But ultimately it comes down to a calorie deficit and that's why it helps people lose weight. Um, so you can get a calorie deficit a lot of different ways. I mean, you get it through fasting. You can get it through uh, just watching the calorie density of your food. Um, it doesn't have to be one certain way or another. So if it works well for you, that's fantastic. I will just mention um, there is some uh, science to suggest that eating in the day is better, like it's more efficient to metabolize it during the daytime hours rather than the nighttime hours. So if you're fasting, until you know like 3 p.m and then you're having heaps of food into the evening hours that may not be as beneficial metabolically speaking as if if you're having a really big breakfast and then avoiding like a, a large dinner um, so there's a lot of kind of questions still to be answered in this space basically the take-home message is as far as weight loss is concerned the reason why it's working is because it's putting you into a calorie deficit there's a lot of ways that you can actually get into a calorie deficit so it's not a necessity Excellent, excellent. And just on that one too, it ties in with this ketogenic or ketogenic, um, uh, I guess, I don't know if it's a fad or, but it's sort of like, it's similar to the old Atkins diet, I think, but a lot of people, you know, are sort of, uh, a lot of my friends are all very keto, keto. So when you suggest no meat, may they, they're open to the idea of that, can I do it on a keto diet? And um, it, I, it's interesting, your slide before showed about how much protein general, generally plant-based eaters get anyway. So. Um, what well, do you have thoughts on keto or, or, or um, yeah, a lot of health professionals I talk to just think it's, it's bullshit? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, it's definitely <laughs> not something I would it works recommend. For some people. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you raise a good point. Everyone is slightly different, but we are all humans. Um, so there's not that much variability in us. Um, I don't recommend keto diets like I if you're trying to diet as for health I would recommend a whole food plant-based diet so plenty of healthy carbohydrates that's the difference there it's got to be healthy carbohydrates not refined carbohydrates um, but if you just are adamant that you want to do keto diet there is an eco Atkins diet you can do you can do plant-based keto um, so it is a possibility for this month but I would recommend a, a whole food plant-based diet not a keto diet for long-term health yeah there's excellent. a lot of unknowns there Excellent. Um, yeah, what's the other, other one I thought, heard recently? Like I was reading about one of our posts had this cute little um, cute little uh, monkey, baby monkey eating a mango or something. And I was just reading what, what do primates eat, you know, in terms of chimpanzees and 
bonobos and the who are, basically we have like 99.9 percent .9 same dna mm. and, and our, our digestive tracts are the same so when people talk about these paleo diets or you know looking at our ancestors what did they eat which is kind of strange anyway because that was so much so long ago but when you look at you know genetically what we're connected to we are primates you know and and our what what do our other primates eat they all eat predominantly even though 100 percent a predominantly plant-based diet so absolutely that, that to me was a bit of a little light bulb moment which felt like that's what we've got to head to towards um yeah, yeah. but um yeah uh just to thank you again I, I mean i think as this uh we had some really great questions come through uh, i think we've answered a lot of them or most of them but we'll get questions come through later so if you if you've got a question um throw it in the thread and emma um and or someone from from them and they will come back to you with some some evidence-based uh information to support you guys um, but just again to thank emma so much for your time and the doctors for nutrition uh it's wonderful and really uh, <laughs> Really great for everyone to get off on the right foot because we want we want people to do no meat may, but we want them to do it right. So this is wonderful. Thanks, Emma. Thank you so much. Good luck, everyone. Have fun. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again.